Good morning, afternoon, or evening, folks, and welcome to Cast of All Trades, the show where we talk about developing skills, exploring ideas, and following curiosity. I'm your host, Orion Siebert. In this episode, I sit down with Terry Tucker, a former NCAA basketball player at the Citadel, former marketer for Wendy's, a former SWAT hostage negotiator, an author, a motivational speaker, and more. That said, we don't talk about any of that. In this episode, I sit down with Terry Tucker, a family man, a cancer warrior with the battle scars to prove it, and a wise man. We discuss the importance of family and how little time you really have left with your parents, how curses and afflictions can become blessings that shift the direction of our lives, how you can become the man or woman who can step up to meet the needs and expectations in difficult situations, and much more. This interview didn't go in the direction I thought it would. I thought we would be talking about his very varied career over the years, the skills he developed, what transferred from one place to another, but in the end, none of that came up. By the end of this episode, I had used all of the questions that I wasn't expecting to touch on and none of the questions I thought we would be discussing, and I don't regret it in the slightest. Terry is a wonderful man, and I'm personally grateful for the wisdom he shared on this episode. And for more interesting interviews like this that you don't know what direction they're going to go in, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out. I believe that about covers it. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Terry Tucker. Terry, it's a pleasure to have you on today. Orion, thanks for having me on. I'm really looking forward to talking with you. Yeah, you reached out to me on our little matchmaker.fm. I call it the dating profile or the dating app of podcasters. I'm pretty sure that's how they tried to frame it, just because just because of the name and how it all looks. But you reached out to me on that, and right away, your message caught me, your profile caught me. It's like, wow, this person has had some life experiences. I got to talk to this person. And even preparing for this episode more and more, I just kept on digging and digging. And so much, I thought, wow, Terry, you have lived an interesting life. And I, I got to learn more about this. Well, it just means I'm old. So, but I appreciate you saying that. So. <laughs> I prefer well-aged or wisdomed. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So for those of you who don't know, who are you and what is it that you do? Sure. So I'll try to give you the, the short version here. I grew up on the south side of Chicago. I am the oldest of three boys. You can't tell this from looking at me or from my voice, but I'm six foot eight inches tall and actually went to college on an athletic scholarship, a basketball scholarship. When I graduated from college, I moved home to find a job. I'm, like I said, really going to date myself now. This was long before the internet was available to help people find employment. Fortunately, I found that first job in the corporate headquarters of Wendy's International, the hamburger chain in their marketing department. That was the good news. The bad news was I lived with my parents for the next three and a half years as I helped my mother care for my father and my grandmother, who were both dying of different forms of cancer. Uh, after I started at Wendy's, my next job was actually to go to work for the hospital that cared for my father and my grandmother as they were dying. And then at 37 years old, I made a major pivot in my life and became a police officer. And part of what I did during that experience is I was a SWAT hostage negotiator. After my law enforcement career, I started a school security consulting business, coached girls high school basketball when we lived in Texas. But for the last 12 years now, I've been battling a rare form of cancer, a rare form of melanoma. And I guess just finally, my wife and I have been married for 31 years. We have one child, a daughter, who's in the military here in the United States. Well, there's so much there I want to unpack. Uh, first of all, there's one thing that you mentioned there that I want to touch a bit more on, on the, you moved back home with your parents as you were working, as you're working this Wendy's job. And there's one part there that you said that kind of struck me, reminded me of an interesting statistic of... Oftentimes when you graduate college or when you move out for the first time, you have spent 90% of the time you'll ever spent with your parents by that point in time. So you might see them for 10% more, like you might have 10% more opportunities to see them. That'll usually be Christmas or Thanksgiving or holidays to go and visit them. So perhaps it was an extra little blessing in disguise to be able to spend that extra time with your mom, with your dad, with your, with your grandparents, to be able to spend that little extra time there because... 
I don't know. I also recently graduated college and moved back in with my family. And I thought about that as I was moving back because for me, I don't, I don't necessarily want to, like, I don't want to be here. Like, yes, I love my parents. I love my family, but I liked my independence. That was great. It was so wonderful. And moving back home feels like a sort of regression of sorts, but at the same time, it's also a blessing to be able to spend that extra time with our families. So just wanted to put, put that out there of perhaps it wasn't necessarily a step back and a little extra blessing in disguise. It was. I, I mean, I feel very fortunate that uh, I had that time with, with my family. You know, you, you, you're you right. You kind of graduate from college and you're like, all right, I'm going to go blaze my own trail now. I'm going to I'm going to do my thing. And then life kind of hits you in the face. It's like, oh, hold on there, fella. You know, you need to do this. And, you know, it, it's interesting because there, there's kind of a backstory to my resume that sort of fits in with that. And it's that, you know, I wanted to follow in my grandfather's footsteps. My grandfather was a Chicago police officer from 1924 to 1954. And in 1933, he was actually shot in the line of duty with his own gun. It was not a serious injury. He was shot in the ankle. But my dad, who was an infant at the time, remembered the stories my grandmother told of that knock on the door of Mrs. Tucker, grab your son, come with us. Your husband's been shot. And so when I expressed an interest in going into law enforcement, my dad was absolutely not. You're going to college. You're going to major in business. You're going to get out. You're going to get married. You're going to have 2.4 kids. You're going to live happily ever after. Mm -hmm. But that's the life my father wanted me to live. That's not the life I felt I was supposed to live. So I had a really big, major adult uh, lifestyle choice when I graduated. I could have said, hey, dad, I know you're dying. Sorry about that, but I'm going to go do my own thing or out of love and respect for you, I will do what you want me to do. And so my first two jobs were in business because that's what my dad wanted me to do. But you're right. I mean, I, I think about that and I cite that statistic. I'm trying to remember, it, it's like 80% of the time you spend with your kids is over by the time they're 18 and 90% of the time is over by the time you're 21. And I look at my own daughter um, who's in the military, who will be home with her husband uh, next week and spend a week with us. That's the entire time I will spend with her this entire year. So, you know, I love my daughter. I want to be around her and things like that. I mean, fortunately we have, you know, FaceTime and things like that allow us to do that, that we didn't have when I was growing up, but it, it's not the same as having them here, being there, being with us and stuff like that. So I, it was a blessing. It, you know, it was a curse and a blessing at the same time. Uh, I wish they weren't dying, but at the same time, I really got to have some great talks, some great one-on-one -on -one time with them that I may not have had otherwise. It's interesting that you mentioned this dichotomy of, do I go out and live my own life? Do I go out and try to do my own thing? I wanted to become the police officer and I want to go serve my country and do that. And for that, I want to say thank you for your service as an officer and be able to do that. That's not something that everyone can go and do. And I personally really appreciate it. You're welcome. But you had to make that choice of, do I go out and live the life that is expected of me to go to college, to take these corporate jobs, or do I go out and live the life I want to make? And how did you, how did you work out that decision for yourself? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, I guess one of the things that I am most proud of in my life is that I never let my dream die. I never let my purpose die. As I mentioned, I became a police officer at 37 years old, which is pretty old to be getting into that, that line of work. But it was always something I knew I wanted to do. And it was always something I felt I was supposed to do. And, you know, when I graduated from college, I mean, you know, I'm 21 years old. So it was a long time, relatively speaking, before I got into what I really finally was, I felt my purpose. And, you know, we a lot of times we use that word purpose, and we use it in the singular, like there's one thing that we're supposed to do. And at least from my life, I can say that word is plural. That word is purposes. You know, when I was younger, I felt my purpose was to be an athlete. I was a really good basketball player. And then I finally got to a point in my life where, all right, in terms of an occupation, this is it. This is what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to be in law enforcement. And now I've been on a lot of law enforcement since 2005, so quite a while. 
now, as I'm in all honesty, probably coming to the end of my life or towards the end of my life, I think my purpose has shifted again. And, you know, it would be great if our purpose in life could align with our job or our occupation, but it doesn't have to. I mean, your job could be over here. It's what you do to pay the bills, but your purpose is over here to be a podcast host, to be an author, to be a writer, to, to be an artist, to be an activist, to be whatever it is you feel is in your heart. But I think a lot of times we dismiss that. We get comfortable. And we're like, you know what? And I could have done that. I was a hospital administrator. I could have been like, you know what? Making good money. This job isn't that hard. But I gave that up to make less money and do something that was more fulfilling for me. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of wisdom in that. And digging into that a little bit more, this idea of your purpose is not a singular thing. I'm reminded of the concept of Ikigai in Japan, where for them, it's sort of a similar concept to the idea of purpose, of it's something that you get up and you go and do every day. But the main difference between how perhaps Westerners or Americans think of purpose being a singular, infinite, like this is the thing I'm destined to do for the rest of my life sort of thing, is the Japanese term of Ikigai is much more, this is what you're doing for now. Perhaps it will change in the future. Perhaps you'll have two or three purposes, and that will shift through time. And another thing that that sort of reminds me of is this concept of mythic archetypes of the storytellers or the hero's journey, where they start off at the beginning with, this is my purpose. I'm going to live my life in the village. Then I go out and go on an adventure. And they say, now this is my purpose. And as time goes on, they might graduate from being the hero to becoming the, the sage or the wizard to pass on their knowledge to people around them. And this idea of shifting purpose that it's strange to me how this isn't talked about or how this isn't mentioned nearly as much as you have to go out and find your purpose as if it's a singular entity of this is the only thing you're going to do with your life it amazes me to some extent that we don't we don't acknowledge that you're right and, and we also put these arbitrary timetables on it you know and i think that's where where young people especially you know get down get depressed and, and feel anxiety that there's a well, you know, I need at this point in my life when I'm 25, I need to be doing this and I meet, I need to be making this much money. And when I'm 35, I need to be having a, a relationship, a stable relationship. Maybe I'm married. Maybe I have a couple kids and stuff like that. And and those are arbitrary timetables. You just put them out there for yourself. And then when you don't reach them, you get anxious, you get worried, you get depressed. And one of the, the most interesting things, uh, remember the name of Jeff Wetzler, I believe was his name wrote a book called Ask. And I heard him on a podcast and, and he talked about looking at life differently. And the more I thought about the way he suggested it, the more I thought about how much it really made sense. And what he said was, instead of doing that arbitrary timetable and, and of looking at your life sort of year by year by year, he suggested looking at your life in decades. And so he said, in your 20s, you should do everything. You should dig into stuff that, you know, maybe I'll like that. I don't know. Oh, you know, I tried that. No, I didn't really like that. Okay, I'm going to try this now. I'm going to try this. I'm going to try this. Get out there, do everything. Make mistakes, screw up. Do, I mean, do all that kind of stuff. And then in your 30s, kind of find, as you just said, those two or three things that you can kind of dig into. They're in your heart. They're in your soul. You think those are the things that you're supposed to spend your time on. And then he said in your 40s, find that one thing. You know, you're usually more established. You're, you're more mature. You have a better understanding of life. What's that one thing? What's that one thing that you feel you're supposed to do? And then he said in your 50s and your 60s, you can reap the, the benefits, reap the rewards of what you did in your 20s, 30s, and 40s. And I think if you look at life like that, if you look at life in decades, you don't get so caught up in, well, I'm 25, I'm halfway through my 20s and I'm not where, no, you got your, all your 20s to get into all that stuff, to get into as much trouble as you can possibly get into. But then in your 30s, you've got another decade. So if you look at your life more in the decades portion, as opposed to the year by year or month by month or goal by goal, it's a little less overwhelming and gives you a little more time to figure things out. There's a quote that that very much reminds me of that people underestimate what they can people overestimate what they can do in a year, but they underestimate what they can do in a decade. 
where people will always say, oh, I want to make this much money. I want to fly to this place. I want to have this job, this house, this, like this spouse, this kind of car, whatever. And they say, I want to have it by the end of this year. And yet they always seem to forget that, wait a second, fortunes are not built in years, are not built in a year. They're built in decades. Like the best athletes dedicate their lives, maybe not just to one, like maybe not to one sport, but they've like, as they're growing up, they dedicate themselves to a number of sports. They go and they try a bunch of things. They say, I'm going to play soccer and basketball and hockey. And over time, they might say, I like this one the most. I'm going to dedicate more time to this. And then they keep on playing and playing and playing. And it takes decades to do so. But eventually they get there to the point of, I am at the top of my field in this in this sport. I don't know why I picked sports. I'm not a sports player at all. But it's a apt example of this idea that you don't become a master at something in a year. You don't become the expert in one year. It takes it takes time. It, it does, and 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 I love another another quote from and I'll I'll use a sports analogy here. Usain Bolt, the, the fastest man in the world, and and his quote was, "I spent four years learning how to run nine seconds, and people give up on their dreams after two months." you know, after putting the effort in after, oh, of two months and things like that. And we do, you know, we want, we're, we're an instant gratification society. You know, I mean, I learned that at Wendy's, you know, what, what is Wendy's? It's quick service, you know, I don't feel like uh, cooking tonight. So bang, I'm going through the drive through and there, there's dinner. That's, that's the way we consume. We consume our data. We consume our relationships. We consume our meals quick. I want it. I want it now. I want everything to work out. And you're right. That's, that's not what life is. I mean, life is, is a journey. You know, we always talk about, you know, the end of the rainbow or the top of the mountain. And what people don't realize is getting to the top of the mountain, all that time in between when you start and when you get there, that's life. That, that's what life is really all about. It's what you learn. It's the struggles that you overcome. It's the adversity that you face. It's the tears that you shed to get there. That's what life is all about. It's not getting to the end of the rainbow because then you get there and you're like, oh, well, what's next now? It's all that stuff in, in the middle. Enjoy the journey. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to touch on this until later, but it naturally came up. So a question that I wanted to ask you as someone who is, as you mentioned before, you've developed cancer, you've gone through pain and struggle and much difficulty throughout your life. Do you think that we need to go through adversity to learn, to grow and develop as human beings? Or might we be able to grow without experiencing as much adversity? You know, if cancer's taught me anything, it's taught me two things. It's one, I don't think you really know yourself until you've been tested by some form of adversity in your life. So I would say, no, you need to, you need to have something that you butt up against, something that gets in your way that you figure out how to get around it, over it, through it, whatever it ends up being. If you never have struggles in your life, I don't really think you know how far you can push yourself to make something happen. And the second thing I'll say about cancer, and this may sound kind of foreign or kind of off the wall, is that cancer's made me a better human being. I appreciate cancer. If you asked me, could if you went back and, and lived your life, would you do it without cancer? I would say no, because cancer's really focused me on what's important. I mean, I've spent so much of my life being physical, being athletic, you know, whether it was in law enforcement, whether it was at playing sports in college and things like that. And today I sit in a wheelchair and I don't have a left leg. Now, how do you balance those things? And I think the way you balance them is when you can't do what you're good at, you do what's important. And that's really kind of what I feel I've been doing for the last 12 plus years of, of going through cancer is I've been doing what's important. In all honesty, playing sports when I was younger, probably not really in, you know, in the scheme of life, not really that important. You know, the things I did in law enforcement may be a little more important to some people, but the things I do now, the relationships that I have, the being on, on talks or on podcasts on giving talks, uh, right now, those things to me are really what's important in life. There's this concept of importance versus urgency, where people are often bombarded with, oh, you have to do this now. It's very urgent. 
how can we start to differentiate between what's important for us to actually do and what's like urgent or just clamoring for our attention? How do you think we can start to differentiate those? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think it goes back to sort of the immediate gratification society that we live in. Everything's important. Everything's urgent. Everything you need now. And, and you're right. You don't. You, most things you don't need. I mean, once you get past, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs where you have your basic needs met, what then do you focus your, your effort, your time, your attention on? And I would say that has to do with what your values are in life. And we don't talk about that very much. We don't talk about what our values are in life. We talk about stuff. And, and Orion, I've seen so many people in my life that feel they're born empty. And that when they get out of school and they get into life, whatever that looks like for them, that then their job is to fill up their empty self. You know, that they've got to they got to get a great job and they've got to make a lot, a lot of money and they've got to you know drive the nicest car, have the best family and have all the latest gadgets and gizmos. And what I found is it's just the opposite. We're not born empty. We're born full. We're born with everything we need to be successful. However, you define that word in your life already inside us. We just need to take it, find it, pull it out, use it for our benefit. So our job in life, in all honesty, should not be to fill ourselves up. Our job in life, in my opinion, should be to empty ourselves out with our unique gifts and talents, certainly for the betterment of ourselves, but also for the betterment of our families, our friends, our communities, our countries. And when you look at life that way, not like I got to get, I got to get, because when you, when you live a life that's I've got to get stuff to make me happy, there's always one more thing to get. There's always one more gadget to get or one nicer car to get or one more, you know, hundred thousand dollars I've got to make, whatever it ends up being. There's always one more thing. When you give of yourself, when you make other people's lives better with no expectation of anything from them, all of a sudden you just, at least for me, you just feel better about life. You feel better about yourself you feel better about your purpose on this planet. Absolutely. As you were talking there and a quote popped into my head, I don't know if it's a quote that exists or just this idea that popped into my head, but the hedonic treadmill, people's adaptation knows, has no upper speed limit. You can run and run as fast as you can to try to get the new thing, to live like the Joneses, to get the new car, to get the next 100K, to get the nicer house, the nicer things, the fancy bling. But the faster you run, the faster that treadmill is going to speed up. There's always more. There's always one more step. And you'll never hit top speed on there. And it's this... It's hedonic treadmill for a reason. Because you're always going to be moving in place. Or you're going to be flying backwards if you can't keep up. And yeah, really it is just you're, you're switching right. the and, game. And, that's it. And, and you drive yourself crazy. You know, and, and that's where fear and anxiety and depression come from. I Oh, I'm not there. Where's there? And why do you need to be there today? Why can't you get there tomorrow? And again, it's what you learn along the way. It's not, I got there. It's what did I learn? What did I learn from the failure, from the adversity, from the fear, from these things that I experienced? What did I learn about myself? And, and that's, you know, that's the thing I think we miss. I've got to get there. Okay, now you're there. What'd you learn? Oh, heck, I don't know, but I got there. You know, and I think that's that's the issue. I didn't learn anything. I mean, life is about learning. Life is about growing. Life is about developing. You know, and and most young people, I mean, your prefrontal cortex, the, the thing that governs your decision making doesn't fully form in all of us until at least 25. Sometimes people later in your early 30s and stuff like that. So you're not making good decisions at that point in your life. So I just got to get there. Well, why? Because society tells me I, that's where I have to be. Or my parents told me that. Or my professor told me that from school. You know, you need to have this. Really? What do you say? What do, what, what do you, you know, stop for a minute, relax, think about, take some time. There's a, there's a great book called Do Hard Things. It's written by Steve Magnus. And Magnus used to be the head track and field coach at the University of Minnesota, and, and uh, coincidentally. And he talks about a study that was done during, I don't, I don't know, at some point in time where they used university students. 
And they basically brought them in, put them in a room with nothing in the room but a chair and a table. They were not allowed to have any devices, any, any iPhones, ear pods, anything. Here you are in a room, no windows, no just the door, a table, and a chair. The only other thing in the room was a buzzer. And if you press the buzzer, you received an electric shock. Now, they only asked you to be in there for like 15 or 20 minutes. It wasn't like you were going to be in there for days or anything like that. But the interesting thing about it is 68% of the men and 25% of the women shocked themselves, including one guy who shocked himself on average every five seconds. And the whole point of that was we're not comfortable in our own skin. We're not comfortable unless we're on a device and somebody, oh, what did somebody say about me? Or do they like my hair? Do they like what I'm wearing? Do they do they like my, whatever it is. And so we're taking our worth based on what somebody tells us on one of these devices. And when I read that book, when I read that story, I spend about 10 minutes every day just decon deconnecting, I, I, nothing. I'm just going to sit in a chair. I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to meditate. I'm going to let my mind go wherever my mind wants to go. And people are not comfortable doing that today. They're, they don't know who they are. So they're not making good decisions for themselves. There's a lot there that I want to unpack. First off, that's one of my favorite studies that I've ever I've ever learned about. As you were talking about it, I thought to myself, yep, that, that makes a lot of sense. People cannot, people need stimulation. The brain mm -hmm. says, well, I can't sit here on my own. Uh, you have to, like, it's going to hurt, but that's going to at least be better than me trying to confront myself in my own brain. So people hit the button. And I'm pretty sure in that study, they knew what the, st what the shock would feel like before going into the room. So it wasn't even a new stimulus. It was just, yeah, it's slightly different than the discomfort of sitting with myself. Mm -hmm. And I was reminded of a quote, probably one of my favorite quotes, that your mind is the greatest prison you'll ever live in because it's one you'll never escape. The warden's always on watch. And the only thing you can do is you can either face it or you can sedate yourself to who knows what end. People much prefer the other, much prefer to sedate themselves with their phones, video games, drugs, food, exercise, you name it, pick your poison. People do not want to confront their own mind. And it amazes me. It's something that I try to do more actively and it sucks sometimes. It really does. Like I can remember days of just sitting on the ground, thinking to myself, being trapped in my own brain, almost feeling like uh, that quote of when you gaze into the abyss, the abyss gazes back into you. Like, really, really feeling that. It's the only way I can describe it. Like being able to just sit there with it for sometimes days. It, it's an interesting, I don't even know how to properly describe it from here, an interesting experience. I feel like more people need to actively try to get. But yet... This idea of if you're bored for a moment, like you have to sedate that. You have to shove it aside. You can't be bored. Why would you be bored? Boredom is bad. Hurry, like take your take your electronic screen here. Look at it. Poke poke the pretty colors. Our world is so full of distractions, as you talk about with the immediate gratification society that we live in. It doesn't have room anymore for introspection, for nuance, for slowing down. And yet that's probably the thing that we need most today. It is because most of the stuff that we get exposed to, if you think about it, if you never got exposed to it, would your life be any really any different? You know, would, would you, is it stuff that you you grow? With? You know, I mean, I remember seeing a picture recently. It's like, let's get rid of the man cave and let's bring back the study. You know, let's let, let instead of having all the the goofy gadgets and the gizmos and the TV, you know, the nine thousand inch television set that you know I'm going to watch the ball game. What if you had a study where you had books and you had things that made you better that you, you learned from? And, and you know what? Even being an old guy, I, I like I like the distractions occasionally, you know, of of on social media. But I also try to find things that make me better, that make me smarter, that make me pause. And hmm, let me think about that. Everything in I moderation. Feel? Yeah, exactly. Everything in moderation. We all, you, you need to unplug. You need to you just kind of do mindless things from time to time. It's, it's okay from time to time, but to make your entire life that way and to make your identity basically, you know, oh, Sally said, or Jane said, or Tom said something about me, I, you know, on social media, what did they say? Oh, they said they didn't like what I was wearing today. Really? Who cares? You know, they, they're, they're jealous of me. They're mad at me. They're whatever. It's like, why do you care what people who have never even attempted 
what you have failed in your life, why do you care what they what they say about you? I I, I don't I don't get it, but I do get it. I, I do understand why you want to be part of the group. You want to be included and things like that. But at the same time, the value you put on those people in terms of I, I don't, I, I mean, why? Why do I really care what he said? He's never even attempted the things that I failed in my life. Why do I care what he thinks? It, it's it's sort of that yin and yang, that pull on you of, I do care, but why do I really care? Because it, in, in the scheme of things, it really doesn't, it doesn't matter. Does it matter what you wear today? Does it matter how your hairstyle is today? Does it matter whether you got a new tattoo or a nose ringer? In the scheme of life, does it really matter? It really doesn't matter at all. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. One of the best experiences or experiments that I can recommend everyone go out and try to do, go back one to two years, pick any news site that you want. What was urgent? Like what was, what were they screaming that was so urgent that you had to know right now? How important is that thing today? Always, it's breaking news or brand new, urgent. You have to know about this thing or else you're behind. And it's going to ruin your life if you don't know about the thing. Go back one to two years and just look at what was breaking news then. And just see how important was that really? Like 99% of the time, it doesn't have any impact on your life whatsoever. And, and yet, we get so caught up with the headlines of, you have to know about this dangerous thing happening halfway around the world that's probably never going to impact you or... Maybe it will impact you, but you knowing about it isn't going to affect anything. It's it's interesting. That's that's all I can call it. It's interesting. I mean, it is. And and that's, you know, there's a there's something going around the Internet about the difference between perception and perspective. And, you know, perception is how you how I view life. And it's based on our, our upbringing, our education. Um, our world, you know, our, our experiences, our religion. It's basically everything that's happened in our lives is how we perceive life. And it's great for us, but only for us, because it doesn't matter to anybody else because they all have their own percep perception. The, the interesting thing is perspective and perspective is, OK, can I look at Orion and say, hmm. Can I walk in your shoes? What do I see there? You know, what experiences have you had? What, what things have you accomplished in your life? What adversities have you overcome in your life? What are your goals in life? Can I see life from your point of view? And we all think that life revolves around us, that the world revolves around us. And as much as we like to think that, it really doesn't. It, you know, we're, we're all in this. If COVID taught us anything, it's how much we need each other. You know, when, when, when we were isolated, when we couldn't be together, you know, alcoholism rates went up, divorce rates went up, drug abuse rates went up, and domestic violence rates went up. We are not good by ourselves. Nobody does anything great in a vacuum. We do it with other people. And I, I think that's that whole, can I see life from another person's point of view? Understanding that I didn't walk in your shoes, but can I get a glimpse of what your life is? And do I care what your life is? Or do I just care about my life and how my life affects everybody else around me? And I, and I love that. I love just kind of sitting back. I used to enjoy that when I, when I traveled, when I was in airports and sort of doing the people watching. And it's like, what's that oh, guy's story? Yeah. What's that guy's story? What's that woman's story? You know, is mm -hmm. this person, this is this. I, I remember when I was flying back, when I, I lived in Chicago and I went to college in South Carolina and I remember flying back um, and I was in the Atlanta airport. And I remember a guy, you know, dressed in a suit, he had a briefcase, you know, looked like a businessman. He had a heart attack and they were like working on him. And, you know, he was down and they were doing CPR. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, you know, what will if, I hope he, I hope they get him back. I don't know if they ever did. But what's his family going to be like when they get that call or when they get that knock on the door of, you know, Mrs. Smith, your husband had a heart attack in the Atlanta airport. The guy was alone. He wasn't with his family. I mean, how many people walk past that and be like, huh, guys having a heart attack? Okay, well, you know what? I got to get to this meeting because this is important. It's like, wait a minute, this guy potentially may be dying and you're not even aware of your thoughts are way away from what's going on and not centered on what is happening immediately. Mm -hmm. I, just, I just thought it was interesting to kind of look at his life and think, 
what his family would be experiencing if he didn't make it. Yeah. Earlier in this conversation, you mentioned living a successful life and defining our own values. That's something I want to explore a little bit more. It's a question. This is a question that I like to ask a couple of my guests, and that is, how do you define what it means to live a successful life? What does it mean to you? You know, the, the greatest definition of success that I have ever heard in my life, um, and I and I adopted it. I was a big fan of a basketball coach when I was growing up by the name of John Wooden, who coached at UCLA and at the time was the most successful, probably college or professional basketball coach in the world. And Wooden, in addition to being a coach, was a teacher. He, he wanted his players to understand that this wasn't about basketball. Sports was teaching you about life, how to be a good teammate, you know, how to be coachable and things like that. And wouldn't define success this way. And I've, like I said, I've never heard a better definition. And here's what he said. He said, success is peace of mind, which is a direct result of self-satisfaction in knowing that you did the best to become the best that you're capable of becoming. And he used to say, you know, as, as I mentioned, he was a teacher, he was a high school teacher before he became a college basketball coach. And he said, you know, the person who struggles and struggles and struggles to get a C in my course is probably more successful than the person who didn't really struggle at all and got an A in my course. You know, it's, it's putting in that time. It's putting in that effort. It's overcoming the adversity that you experience to define what success. That's, that's what success is. And, and I love the definition because Here's this guy who was probably the winningest coach in basketball. And if you look at that definition, it doesn't say anything about winning. It just says, did you do the best to become the best you're capable of becoming? That's what I think the definition of success is. I love that definition and I might have to adopt that for myself, but I like going around and collecting different definitions sure. of success from different people, just because it's a sort of the question that honestly spawned a lot of my like a lot of my deep dive research, philosophy, psychology, all of that, because I, I think about the traditional, quote unquote, traditional definition of success being the penthouse apartment with the corner office guy making a million bucks a year. And I remember talking to, uh, I was in college at the time, talking to one of my professors and asking him this question. And he, I don't know if it was him or if it came from another place, but I remember hearing about he knew a guy exactly like that, who had the penthouse apartment, who had the million dollar job, who had the corner office and him saying, I don't have a relationship with my kids. I don't know my wife. I don't know any of them. It was like he climbed up a ladder, but the ladder is leaning up against the wrong wall. And by all societal definitions, he was successful. But according to his own personal values that he didn't know for the longest time, but were finally revealed to him in that moment of, I don't know my kids. I don't know my wife. I don't know my family anymore. I just get up and go to work and come back home. And that's my life. That wasn't living a successful life, not to him. Perhaps to everyone on the outside, he looked to be successful, but he wasn't. Compare that to the uh, Tibetan monks who own nothing. They own nothing but the robes on their back and maybe not, not even that. And talking to them, they are some of the most peaceful, the most joyous, the most happy, in my mind, the most, some of the most successful people I can possibly think of. These people who have like forsaken almost any worldly possession, almost any worldly thing to hone their craft of, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm going to pursue. And I'm going to dedicate my life to pursuing this thing. And from what I've seen, it's this idea of progression is happiness, not the destination, where you often see, like in the Olympics especially, you see gold medalist depression, where you'll get someone who's dedicated their, their life year after year after year, and eventually makes it to become a, becoming a gold medalist athlete at the Olympics. They're happy, they're on top of the world for a moment, and then what do they do tomorrow? What do they do the next day? They spent their lives dedicated to this one thing, and by all means, they're successful, but where do they progress from here? In my mind, the best place that you can be if you're taking that route is to be second place because then you know, I can only go up. My goal is to be progressing. I don't care how far or how fast I go. I just want to go up. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and my wife has been in the financial services industry for 
her, her entire career for over 40 years and had a mentor that basically could have been the poster child of the person you just, you know, talked about, you know, great job on Wall Street, you know, had the apartment, had the house in Greenwich, Connecticut, had three kids. His wife was, you know, graduate of Northwestern University, very smart, very intelligent. But the only time his kids showed up is when they wanted money, you know, hold their hand out. He ended up basically divorcing his wife. His kids didn't talk to him. He lost the house in, in Greenwich. He, he was on the board of an Ivy League business school. I mean, he had more money than God. He eventually found another relationship, bought another house in Greenwich, and then one day out went out in the garage and killed himself. Mm -hmm. And you're right, by any by all accounts, he was successful but he wasn't happy and he wasn't fulfilled. And if you're not happy, if you're not fulfilled, you can have all the success in the world, you're still gonna be miserable. And, I, and there, are, there are thousands, millions of people around the world you know, that are chasing that next dime, that are chasing that next thing. And then if you ask them to stop and slow down and say, okay, what's important in your life? What do you value? What, if they were taken away today, would crush you, would kill you? And a lot of those people couldn't tell you. I mean, they would give you the pat answers. Oh, my family. You don't even know your family. You, I mean, your kids show up when they want. Here, daddy, you know, I get my hand out. Give me some money. All right. Okay, bye. And I'm gone. I I had a, I just finished a week of cancer treatment. And one of the nurses that was taking care of me, we were talking about our, our daughter. And I was telling her, I said, you know, I, I tell my daughter every time I talk to her that I love her and that I'm proud of her. And not in a, you know, kind of, cheap way, but I really am. I really do love her. I really am incredibly proud of her. And she was like, you know, nobody's ever told me that in my life. And she's like in her fifties. She's like, I said, your parents didn't know. Nobody ever told me, you know, that, you know, I love you and I, I, and I hope things work out for you. And, you know, but you know, John wouldn't go back. John wouldn't used to say one of the worst things you can do for another human being is something they can do for themselves. And I think today we do that as parents a lot. You know, we want to swoop in. We're the helicopter parents. It's like, I'll take care of it. I'll take care of all your problems, all your issues. And I remember when our daughter was growing up, I mean, there was a point in time where she was bullied. She was being bullied. And to a point where a girl threw a ball at her and she had glasses on and hit her and, you know, broke her glasses and cut her face. And, you know, as a dad, you want to, you know, I'm a big guy. I kind of want to go in there and, you know, kick a little butt, so to speak. And it was like, do you want me to get involved? And she's like, no, I'll take care of it. And as a middle school kid, you know, you're like, oh, do you have what it takes to take care of it? I don't know. But you know what? You're going to find out. You're going to find out about yourself. You're going to find out what you're capable of doing and, you know, not beating this girl's brains in, but finding another way to handle this situation. And that was so hard as a parent not to swoop in and, and want to make it right. But I also think it was something that taught our daughter a tremendous lesson about what she was capable of in life. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Throughout this, we've touched on this idea of adversity spawning and creating and really making us grow as people. And I hear about these stories and I think to myself, have I gone through that yet? What's that going to be for me? What's what's my adversity going to be? And the thing that I really worry about in that situation is, will I like will that better person, the better me that I want to become, will they walk in the door when I need them to be there? Like, will I be able to step up in that situation? And I don't know, I'm just going to have to wait and see, try my best to prepare myself for it. But for someone who perhaps is sort of in my situation, who doesn't know what that situation is going to be yet, what, what they might have to go and do, what would you recommend to that person to try to prepare themselves, to really better themselves, to become that ideal person that they need to step through that door in that situation? I'll give you three things. Um, and the first one is, don't worry that you haven't have you don't have it all figured out yet. Don't worry that you don't have all the answers. That, I mean, people drive themselves crazy. Like, will, will I will I be that? Relax on that. If you do these next two things, I would say the answer is you will be that person who when it happens. And and the first one is every day of your life, do something that scares you, that makes you nervous, that makes you uncomfortable, that's potentially embarrassing. It doesn't have to be a big thing. But if you do those small, uncomfortable, hard things every day, when the big disasters in life hit us, and they hit all of us, you're absolutely right. You know, we lose somebody who's close to us. We unexpectedly get let go from our job. 
you find out we have a chronic or a terminal illness, you will be so much more prepared, ready to handle that adversity when it presents itself. And the last thing I would tell you is it's more important who you work for and who you work with than it is the work that you do. Find people that care about you. Find people that are willing to invest in you. Find people that are willing to see you be successful, even if they're not as successful as they can possibly be. Find those people in your life, hitch your wagon to those, climb the mountain with those people, and it's amazing how much better your life will be. Right. I'll I'll keep that in mind. I'm reminded of this concept that my dad actually taught me about, of building your own personal board of directors, finding people that, one, do not have any, like, by no means should they have any requirement to be interested in you. Like, they don't, don't make them be family, don't make them be, like, these people who are sort of like society responsibly required to be interested in you. Make the people who are smart in different areas, who have experiences, who have gone through things, and then build trust with them, build a good reputation with them, and then talk with them, share your ideas with them, really build your relationship with them. I have, I've built my own personal board of directors over time. I've added people, I've taken people off the list, just depending on where I've gone, what I've done. And I've contacted that board of directors time and time and time again. And almost always, like, very rarely have they steered me wrong because these people had no financial investment in me said this is just some like some kid that wants to do better for himself he's clearly putting in the effort and they just wanted to they want to be the wizard they want to steer steer the new hero along his path and it's probably one of the biggest blessings i've been able to get from exactly that of finding people who would be willing to invest in me some in somewhat People who would say, I've had my turn. It's time to help out the younger generation. It's time to help out other people. And not all my mentors have been older people than me. Sometimes they're younger. Sometimes they're people who are younger than me. It's just finding the right people who can steer you down the right path. Yeah, and, and it's fulfilling to, to do that, to say, hey, I've learned some stuff along my journey. I don't know it all. I, haven't had, I don't have it all figured out, but I've learned some stuff. And I would be willing to share that with other individuals. I had a, a young man, this is a, a division one college football player who connected with me on LinkedIn. And he, he reached out and he said, hey, can, can I call you? Can, can we have a conversation? I'm like, sure. So he said, you know, I, I've got this, and he did. And he said, I've got this potential job interview and it was a sales job. And he said, I wanna ask you some questions. I said, sure. I said, but let me ask you one question first. I said, if you could have any job in the world, something that's in your heart, something that's in your soul. I said, what would that job be for you? And without missing a beat, he said, I'd be a high school football coach. And my question to him was, then why are we talking about a sales job? And he said, because I need to make money. I'm like, you need to make money or you need to make more money? And we ended up talking about the, the sales job and what questions I thought the manager would ask and things like that. And I said to him afterwards, I said, when, when you finish with your interview, I said, call me back. I said, I'd like to hear how the interview went for you. And he said, okay. You think I've ever heard from him? I'm going to say, I'm going to hope, I'm going to be hopeful and say, I hope you heard from him. Never heard from him. And I don't know whether that's because I, I, I challenged him. Like, you know, I, if, if I, you know, if I get a great job and I'm a great salesman, and I make a lot of money going back to what we were talking about, I'm going to be successful. But in your heart, your heart, your purpose is telling you, I want to be a high school football coach. And, and I think when you have those, those two, you know, that dichotomy that, you know, those two forces sort of pummeling each other, it's like, no, I need to make money. No, I want to be a high school football coach and going back and forth, you know, you're stressed and you're like, am I doing the right thing? Should I be doing something else? And you're, you're, you're not, you're not living your purpose. You're living what society is telling you you think your purpose should be. I, I don't know what happened to that young man, but I hope wherever he is, someday he finds success in his heart. Hopefully he'll find a nice high school that will they'll bring him on. And yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So we've again we're continuing to talk a lot about success and choosing and making decisions on what it is that we want to do versus expectations placed on us. Something that you mentioned earlier, earlier on is 
many of us don't know what our values are. And in my mind, it's our values are what ultimately guide us to making quote unquote successful decisions or making steering towards what we de define to be success. In your mind, how can we start to perhaps work out our own value system? Because as you mentioned before, many of us don't know our own values. If we are, if we sit in the in the room alone for fifteen minutes, we'd rather shock ourselves than actually contemplate what do I value in life. You're right. You're absolutely right. I I guess I guess let me tell you a story about that. I, I when I before I took the job at the hospital, uh, as I was contemplating leaving Wendy's, I went. Uh, I took a, uh, an interview um, for a packaged goods company, and I was meeting with the senior vice president. And we spent 90 minutes, an hour and a half. And in that hour and a half, we talked, he asked me questions about growing up. Basically, you know, what was it like growing up? What was it like playing sports? What was it like having knee surgery? What was college like? What was, and that was the interview. And I asked him afterwards, I, I said, I, I, I've got to ask. I said, we spent an hour and a half. You never asked me one question about marketing, one question about business, one question about, you know, my philosophies or anything like that. It was what was your life like basically growing up? I said, I got to know why, why, why? And he said, well, I got plenty of people around me that will tell me whether you're a good fit for the group. Incidentally, I did not get offered the job. And he said, but I want to hire people of good character. And he said, I believe character, and this is kind of where values come in. Character, he said, I believe is developed in the first 20 years of your life. And the other thing he said that I thought was interesting is he said, character's not taught, it's caught. He said, you're not going to read a book and say, okay, I'm a person of good character. I know what my values are in life. I know what's important to me. You're going to watch other people and you're going to be like, I really like the way she handled that situation. Or boy, mm, he kind of missed the mark on that. I wouldn't have done it that way. And he said, that's how you develop character. That's how you develop your values in life. So I think, I mean, it's not like you can't understand what your values are or develop your values as you get older in life, but I think it's harder because you're much more pliable. You're much more like a sponge when you're young and you're like, yeah, boy, I, I get that. I, I understand. I learned that point. I didn't learn it because somebody told me. I learned it because I watched it. I saw it unfold. So I guess, how would you find your values as you get older? Find people that you feel have good values, that have good character in their life and watch them, emulate them. Like you said, pick up the phone. Hey, can I have lunch with you? Can I have a cup of coffee with you? You would be amazed at the number of quote unquote successful people that are like, sure, I would be more than happy to share what I've learned with you. But you've got to, you, values come from your heart. They come from your soul. They come from things that are important to you, experiences that you have in life, you know, it, it's it's hard to say, okay, I read a book, now I've got values. No, you got it, they come from life. Learn the lessons you're supposed to learn in life, and I think you'll figure out what your values are. Right. There's a lot there that I would agree with, and there's some that I think I would disagree with, where yeah. definitely I agree that we can develop our values by watching other people. For me, I feel like I've learned a lot of lessons in my life, not from going through adversity, but from watching other people go through it to say, I'm not going to make that decision or to yeah. say that person handled that situation very well, but this is how I would change it and maybe do some things differently. But definitely there's a quote that I think sums that up quite well of intelligence is learning from your own mistakes and wisdom is learning from the mistakes of others where being able to cultivate and try to curate both is something that I'm desperately trying to do. But going back to this idea of values that it's something that you sort of catch or observe over time perhaps is a better way to put it i don't know if i would always hmm i'm trying to work this out on the fly right now because it's this, yeah. it's this concept <laughs> that i'm new to that i'm trying to trying to be simultaneously nuanced but quick thinking and it's difficult to do i might have to table that for another time but Understand. um certainly it's something i'm going to think about for a while but perhaps something that i think about when i'm thinking about curating values is I'm definitely someone who much prefers to live in my head as opposed to living in my body, if that makes sense, where mm -hmm. I'm constantly thinking about the future, constantly thinking about 
like things I'm actively working on or ideas and just playing with that for a while. And for me, as I, in my adult life, I've shifted from like religions a bit every once in a while. Like I like to study various religions, various philosophies, different ways of life that people do things. And for me, that's sort of been how I've curated my set of values where Yes, I've adopted a lot from the religion I was born and raised into, but since I left that, I still kept a lot of those values, but I discarded some and picked up a couple other ones, and I feel like it was much more an intentional way to perhaps derive the values that I hold personally, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, it, it absolutely does. And and I and I think that's important. I, I mean, faith, religion, I mean I'm I'm a cradle cradle Catholic always have been. And, you know, I get a lot of brush back from that. You know, how could you be a Catholic with all the, you know, the sexual scandal It's like, well, I didn't do that stuff. I mean, I, I can't live your life any more than you can live my life, you know, and, and what those people did was wrong. And I think everybody would say it was wrong and I would say it was wrong, but I mean, let's face it, you know, Jesus came, you know, it's kind of the quote that he's, uh, and I wish I could remember which gospel it came out of, you know, I, I came for the sick. The, the the wealth people don't need me. You know, I, I came, came for the to sick, help. the poor, and the needy because they're the yeah, ones who I, desperately I came need for me. those people. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't come for the people that that are righteous and and are, are are right with God and stuff like that. Well, that's all of us. I mean, let's face it, and none of us are you know in that situation. But you know, I can't earn my way to heaven. I, there's nothing. I mean, I am a sinner. I will. There's nothing I can do that say, okay, God, I'm perfect. I should come to heaven. He's gonna be like, absolutely not. But I learned a lot of my values from my faith, from my family. You know, my, my parents taught my brothers and I the importance of family, of loving each other, of caring for each other, of supporting each other. And I, you know, I was in law enforcement. Both of my brothers are in education. I think we picked up on that and said, okay, our lives are going to be not about making a ton of money, but about service, about giving of ourselves to other people. And I hope our parents would be proud of what we've done in our lives. And I also believe we've passed that on to our children as well. And all our, my brothers and I, all our children are adults now. And did we, did we model, you know, did, did we walk the walk as long and talk the talk? And I think that's incredibly important today. There's a lot of people that are out there that are espousing a lot of stuff, but when you look at what they're doing, it's like, ooh, your language does not go along with your actions and stuff like that. So I don't know. I just threw all that out there for no particular reason whatsoever. So. It's all good. But it sort of ties into the next thing I want to touch on a bit of, if you don't mind me asking, what do you think have been some of the greatest influences on developing your values personally? Oh, certainly my family, I, as, as, as I mentioned, my faith, you know, I, I, I talk about three things that have absolutely gotten me through cancer, which are my three F's, faith, family and friends. You know, I, I have a very strong faith in God and I, I will never forget when I when I had my leg amputated and I found out I had these tumors, which I still have in my lungs. My oncologist showed me my CAT scan and I have no medical background. I don't know how to read a CAT scan, but you can kind of look at it and be like, oh, well, that sure doesn't look like it belongs there. You know, I had these big tumors in my lungs. I had fluid all around the pleural spaces. I was coughing up bleep, green bloody phlegm. And I remember looking at my oncologist and saying, how was I alive? And I will, Orion, I will never forget this till the day I die. He put his head down. He shook his head no. And then he looked up at me and he said, I don't know because you shouldn't have been, which said to me that God's not done with me yet. You know, when I die, where I die, how I die, way above my pay grade, don't spend a lot of time worrying about the dying, spend more time focused on the living. And then the other thing is, is my family. You know, as I, as I mentioned, my parents taught us a lot, but I would be dead. We would not be having this conversation if it hadn't been for my wife and daughter, seeing things, you know, before I saw them or I felt them and getting me the help that I needed so that I'm, I am still here. And then I guess the last thing would be, you know, my friends. And there were, there were people that I was 100% convinced that if something bad happened, they would be there. They, they would not leave me. They would not abandon me. And when I got cancer at 51 years of age, some of them were like, nope, nope, can't deal with this. Can't deal with you at such a young age, having a terminal illness. I, I got I to gotta back out. And then there were people who 
I never expected to be there who have never left the foxhole with me. You know, when the shooting started, they were there and they haven't left since day one over 12 years ago. So faith, family, and friends really have gotten me to where I am. And I, I, I think if, you know, just for simplicity's sake, I will stay with that. Those are the things that have shaped my life, shaped my values, shaped my faith in, in life. Wow. There's a lot there that I've seen in my own life. Like my So I have family that works for the American Cancer, so, so, uh, American Cancer Association or American Cancer Society. I don't remember which it's called, but... And not just that, but I've seen, I've had a number of friends already who've passed away from cancer and seeing that I can, I can see a lot of that in them as well, of them reliant on their family, their friends and their faith and how that really changed and shaped them to see who stuck around and who didn't. It's, it's interesting. I hope that when the time comes for me, if I do have to step up to be that, to be that friend that I can be there for them. Terry, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on today. This conversation did not go anywhere near the conversation I expected that we would be having. So I'm definitely going to have to have you back on again at some point in the future. But it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on today. Well, Ryan, thanks for having me on. I really enjoyed talking with you. You are you restore a lot of times my my faith in in young people. You you're thoughtful, you're considerate, you're you're trying to figure it out. You want to be the person you're supposed to be. And, and I, I love having conversations with people like that. So thank you for this opportunity. Where can people go to learn more from you, to hear more about you, hear what you do? Where can people go? So I have a, a website slash blog called Motivational Check. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff there. You can leave me a message. You can get access to my social medias. You can get recommendations for books to read. And that's all at motivationalcheck.com. Once again, Terry, thank you for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, then please share with a friend you think would like it or share it on social media. It would absolutely mean the world to me and helps the podcast grow so much. With all that said, thanks for listening. I greatly appreciate it. And I'll talk to you all later.